Hello there and welcome to this class. Now I want us to look at a chemistry form 2 paper whereby we are going to discuss each question as we proceed. So the first question is asking define the term element. So what is an element if you have been asked that question in an exam? So an element will say that this is a pure substance that cannot be split into any simple substance by chemical means. So in short, we'll say that an element this is a pure substance that cannot be split into any simpler substances. So that is an element. So the next one, we have an ion. Define an ion. So what is an ion? So ion simply means this is a charged element. So if an element is charged, it automatically becomes an ion. Let's take, for example, we have sodium element, whereby the chemical symbol of sodium element is Na. So this sodium element, the state symbol is solid, as you can see. The electronic configuration of sodium, it is always 281 because the atomic number of sodium is always 11. So since the electronic configuration is 281, this means that sodium is going to lose that one electron in the outermost energy level in order to become stable. So if sodium loses this one electron in the outermost energy level, in order to become stable, therefore it becomes a sodium ion. And this is how you represent the sodium ion. So the electronic configuration of sodium ion in this case, is it is 2,8. And how to write the sodium ion? You write the symbol Na and then plus on top there. So let's take, for example, another element, the next element, which is magnesium. So as you can see, magnesium is atomic number 12. So magnesium symbol is written as Mg and the state symbol is solid down there. So what is the electronic configuration of magnesium? So the configuration of magnesium is 282. So since magnesium has two electrons in the outermost energy level, therefore magnesium is going to lose two electrons in order to become stable. So if magnesium loses these two electrons, therefore magnesium is going to be magnesium ion. So how do you write magnesium ion? So you write Mg and then 2 positive or 2 plus. So if you write Mg and then 2 positive on top there, it will represent that this is magnesium ion and not magnesium atom as, uh, as we can see. This is magnesium atom having the state symbol of solid and th the other one is magnesium ion having a charge of positive 2. Now since we have mentioned charge, so let's look at this charge. Why should we write sodium positive? Why should magnesium have two positive? So this brings us to, to another definition whereby I want us to define valency. So what is valency? So simply valency means these are the electrons going to be gained or lost by an atom or an element. So the electrons going to be gained or lost are the ones which is, are referred to as valency. So in this case, since sodium is going to lose one electron, therefore the valency of sodium is one. Since magnesium is going to lose two electrons, therefore the valency of magnesium is two. The next one is aluminium, which is number 13. So the electronic configuration of aluminium is 283. So the aluminium has three electrons in the outermost energy level. Since aluminium is going to lose these three electrons in the outermost energy level in order to become stable, therefore the valency of aluminium becomes three. Let's take for example sulfur. Sulfur is atomic number 16. So the electronic configuration of sulfur is 286. Now since sulfur is going, uh, since sulfur it is a non-metal rather, sulfur is a non-metal. Therefore sulfur is not going to lose electron, but sulfur is going to gain electrons because it is easier for sulfur to gain two electrons to the nucleus than to lose the six electrons. Therefore, since it is sulfur will require very low energy in gaining electrons than in losing electrons, therefore it will gain electrons. Therefore, the charge of sulfur is going to be negative. So all nonmetals have a charge of negative representing that they gain electrons. As you can see earlier, we had metals, whereby the metals had a, a charge of positive or a valency having a charge of positive. So positive always means losing electrons. And then for the non-metals, they have a charge of negative, which means gaining electrons. Getting back to sulfur. Sulfur, the electronic configuration is 286. Therefore, sulfur is going to gain two electrons in order to become stable. 
We also have oxygen whereby oxygen, the atomic number of oxygen is 8. The electronic configuration of oxygen, it is 2, 6. So since it is 2, 6, it is easier for oxygen atom to gain 2 electrons in order to become stable 2, 8 than to lose the 6 electrons. Therefore, the charge of oxygen is, the charge of the valency rather of oxygen is going to be 2, negative. So that said and done, let's define another term before we move. So the, the other term I want us to define is a radical. So what is a radical? So if you have been asked to define a radical, say that radical, these are atoms reacting as a unit. So they are atoms or elements reacting as a unit. So for example, we have this radical, we have carbonate, whereby as you can see, this is carbonate, CO3, and then the valency of the carbonate is always 2, negative. Apart from that, we also have nitrate, which is a radical. The valency of nitrate is always negative. We also have a sulfate. The, the valency of sulfate is always 2, negative. And then we have a sulfite. So remember, sulfate is SO4, 2 minus. Sulfite is SO3, 2 minus. So the valency of sulfate and sulfite is also 2, negative. As you can see, this valency, it is composed of two elements combined together, two or more elements. Because for hydrogen carbonate, it's also a valency having three elements, which is hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. So the definition of this valency is that these are elements reacting as a unit. For example, if you take a sulfate, if you remove the sulfur from the, that compound which is referred to as the sulfate or the radical referred to as the sulfate, it ceases to be a radical. Therefore, these elements must react together in order to be called a radical. So that is the definition of a radical. We also said, uh, we also mentioned atom. So what is an atom? So if I've been asked to define an atom, you'll say that this is the smallest particle of an element that can take part in a chemical reaction. So that is an atom. So let's go to the next number, which is number two. So number two is asking, identify the following apparatus and give the use of the apparatus. So with this question, first of all, let's define what is an apparatus. So if you've been asked to define an apparatus, you'll say that an apparatus, these are the equipments used in the laboratory to carry out experiments. You should never say equipments used in the lab. There is nothing like lab. It is referred to as laboratory. So these are the equipments used in the laboratory to carry out experiments. Those are the ones which are referred to as the apparatus. So the first apparatus we see that we have the round bottomed flask. Apparatus A is the round bottom flask. What is the use of the round bottom flask? It is used when you want to strongly, or rather not strongly, it is used when you want to evenly heat liquid substances. So if you want to evenly heat liquid substances, we use the round bottomed flask. Also, it is used for general experiments like carrying out certain reactions. So letter B, we have the measuring cylinder. So how will you be able to differentiate between a boiling tube and a measuring cylinder if you have been asked in an exam? So you should know that a boiling tube does not have the readings. So it is not marked. The boiling tube, it's just plain. It doesn't have any of the marks representing how many centimeters cubed or ml. But if you see that you have that apparatus and it is marked like that, as you can see, it is marked. So that represents that it is a, it is a measuring, measuring cylinder. So what's the use of measuring cylinder? It is used to accurately measure the volumes of liquid substances. So the next one we have a letter C, which is deflagrating spoon. What is the function of the deflagrating spoon? It is used when you want to heat solid substances. So if you want to heat solid substances, we take the solid, we place it on that area of the deflagrating spoon, and then we heat from there. So it is used when you want to heat uh, solid substances. So we have this next uh, Roman 2, which is asking, name other apparatus that can be used in place of B. Now, in B, remember, we had the measuring cylinder. The measuring cylinder, we say that the function is to measure accurately the volume of liquid substances. So this question is asking, which other apparatus can be used to accurately measure liquid substances? So the other apparatus that can be used to measure liquid substances, we have syringe. Any apparatus that you can think of, we have syringe, we have the burette, we have the pipette, we have the conical flask. Any apparatus that can be used to measure the volume of liquid substances, fits to be 
the answer for our case. So let's look at question number three. We are being asked. So give reasons why laboratory apparatus are made of glass. So like what are the reasons why laboratory apparatus are made of glass apart from plastic? So the first reason is that glass is easy to clean. So that is very simple. Glass is very easy to clean. The other reason is that for clear visibility of the experiments or the reactions taking place inside the apparatus. So avoid saying that, avoid framing your answer uh, only visibility. If you frame your answer only visibility, you are going to get it wrong. Yeah, your answer will be wrong. This is the reason why you'll get your answer wrong. It's because if you take that glass apparatus and you just observe like this, you're going to see that is visibility. So is that any significant to any reaction being taking place? So you should avoid giving your answers only by saying visibility. Visibility is wrong. If you also say clear visibility, that answer is wrong. So it must be specific. You must specify that for clear visibility for the reactions taking place inside the apparatus so that will be correct so the next one we see that glass is chemically inert what do we mean by chemically inert so this means that glasses are unreactive also you can frame your answer by saying that glass is basically unreactive so if you say that glass is unreactive that will be correct so also glass is easily recyclable whereby it is easy to recycle glass apparatus apart from the the plastic apparatus so let's go to the next number which is question number four we are being asked define the following terms so the first time we are being uh, asked to define we are being asked to define an isotope so what is an isotope so simply an isotope these are elements or atoms having the same atomic number but different mass number so these are atoms having the same atomic number but different mass number like for example, we can take, uh, let's take for example the carbon atom, whereby the carbon atom has six, uh, six protons or six electrons. So the atomic number of carbon is six. The mass number of the real carbon is 12. So we have one carbon which is uh, 12, the mass number is 12, and then the other carbon whereby the mass number is 14. So since they have different mass numbers, therefore, those are isotopes. So they have the same number of protons or the same atomic number, but different mass number. Let's take, for example, we have magnesium. So the atomic number of magnesium is 12. So the mass number of magnesium is 24. So we have magnesium 24 and we also have magnesium 25. So since they have the same atomic number, but different mass number, those are referred to as isotopes. Also, we have chlorine. So chlorine is atomic number 17, and the mass number of chlorine is 35.5. Also we have chlorine, the same atomic number, which is atomic number 17, but now the mass number is 36, or rather is 37. So since they have the same atomic number, but different mass number, that is referred to as an isotope. So the next one, let's define, which is uh, letter B, define ionization energy. So what is ionization energy? So if you have been asked this question, you say that this is the minimum energy required to lose an electron from the outermost energy level. So this is the minimum energy required to remove an electron from the outermost energy level. Let's take for example, we have sodium. This is sodium. So the outermost energy level of sodium has only one electron. So sodium is going to lose this one electron in order to become stable. So, if it loses this one electron, the new configuration is going to be 2, 8. So, since sodium is going to lose one electron in the outermost energy level, so sodium only has one ionization energy. Let's take, for example, the next one, which is magnesium. Magnesium is atomic number 12. So, magnesium, the electronic configuration is 2, 8, 2. Magnesium is going to lose two electrons in the outermost energy level in order to become stable. So since magnesium is going to lose two electrons in order to become stable, magnesium is going to have the first ionization energy separately, and then also it's going to have the second ionization energy separately. So magnesium is going to have two ionization 
energy. So the first ionization energy and the second ionization energy. So let's take, for example, we have aluminium, which is number 13. So this aluminium, the configuration of aluminium is 283. So this aluminium is going to lose three electrons in the outermost energy level in order to become stable. So aluminium is going to have three ionization energy. So the first ionization energy is also going to have the second ionization energy and it's also going to have the third ionization energy. So remember, the ionization energy say that it is the minimum energy required to lose an electron from the outermost energy level of an element in its gaseous state. So that is the ionization energy. So the next one we have electron affinity. So what's the definition of electron affinity? So the definition of electron affinity, it is directly opposite to the ionization energy. Remember ionization is said that the energy required to lose electron. Now electron affinity, this is the minimum energy required to gain electrons by an element yeah, to gain electrons into the outermost energy level of an element in its gaseous state. The definition is exactly the same as ionization energy, but the only difference is that in ionization we lose. In electron affinity, we gain electrons into the outermost energy level. So mostly, the nonmetals, if we are speaking about the nonmetals, we mostly talk about electron affinity in gaining electrons. For the metals, we basically talk about the ionization energy in losing electrons. So let's go to the next one, which is question number five. So question number five is, is asking that hydrogen gas was prepared in the laboratory using the following setup, as you can see. So using the following setup. So you use this setup to prepare hydrogen. So as you can see, we are reacting dilute hydrochloric acid plus zinc granules and then the gas is passing through liquid R and then we are obtaining dry hydrogen gas. Yeah, we are obtaining dry hydrogen gas. So the first question is asking, write an equation for the reaction taking place and balance it. So if you can look at the setup, we see that hydrochloric acid is reacting with zinc granules and then the gas is passing through liquid R and then from the liquid R, the gas is being collected using the upward delivery method. So write an equation for the reaction taking place and balance it. So in this case, an acid is reacting with the metal. So if an acid reacts with the metal, we get salt plus hydrogen gas. But what if acid was reacting with the base? So if an acid reacts with the base, we get salt and water only. But if an acid reacts with the metal carbonate, we get salt plus water and then plus carbon for oxide. But in our case, it's acid reacting with the metal. So acid, which is hydrochloric acid reacting with zinc metal, we are going to obtain zinc chloride as the salt and then hydrogen gas as the gas which will be collected. So to balance this equation is so simple, you only add two in front of hydrogen. So if you add two, not hydrogen, but hydrochloric acid. So if you add two in front of hydrochloric acid, this side hydrogen will be two. On this other side, hydrogen gas will also have two molecules of hydrogen. Chlorine on this side will have two, and on this side also in the salt, we see that we have zinc chloride whereby uh, the valency of zinc is 2, the valency of chlorine is 1. Therefore, the salt zinc chloride will be written as ZnCl2. So the next question is asking, name the method used to collect the gas and give the property of hydrogen enabling it to be collected using that method. So first of all, we have to name this collection method. So you see that uh, we have an inverted, we can say, we can call it a boiling tube or we can call it a measuring cylinder. So uh, we have an inverted apparatus whereby the gas is being directed inside that apparatus, which is upside down. So this method of gas collection is referred to as the upward delivery method. So that method is called upward delivery. So by just looking at the summary of gas collection methods, we see that the first method we have, like we have said, we have the upward delivery method and it looks like that. It can also be called downward displacement method. But just to be cautious, always make sure that you have understood both of them. But if you can be able to understand, 
to understand only one definition, the better. So in this case, let's just focus on one definition. The gas is going up. Let's say we'll call this upward delivery method. So the other method, as you can see, we also have there the downward delivery method, whereby this is basically used to collect denser gases, gases that are basically heavier than air. So apart from that, we have the basic uh, overwater method, whereby hydrogen can also be collected using the overwater method. So what property does hydrogen have in order to be collected by this upward delivery method? So it's so simple, hydrogen is lighter than air. So since hydrogen is lighter than air, it is going to float above air. Therefore, it's going to be collected on top of the inverted apparatus. So the next question is asking, name liquid R and state the function in this setup. So you see that from the reaction, the gas is being passed through liquid R and then it leaves to be collected using the upward delivery method. So... What is liquid R? So liquid R is concentrated sulfuric acid. I have not said conch sulfuric acid. So in writing your answers, make sure you have written the whole word, the whole word and it's supposed to be concentrated sulfuric acid. So in writing your answers, avoid shortening the answer, avoid saying conch. So say that the liquid R is concentrated sulfuric acid. So you should take note, if that liquid R will be labeled dilute sulfuric acid, know that that will be wrong. So it must be concentrated sulfuric acid. So the function of concentrated sulfuric acid, or why is the gas being passed inside concentrated sulfuric acid? So it's, it's because concentrated sulfuric acid acts as a drying agent. So that is the only function of passing the gas inside conch sulfuric acid. So it is a drying agent. So most of the times in chemistry, if you see a gas is being passed inside the conch sulfuric acid, always know that the conch sulfuric acid is going to dry the gas. Basically, if you see in any experiment in chemistry, a gas being passed through conch sulfuric acid, know that the conch sulfuric acid is acting as a drying agent. So the next question, which is D, is asking, Explain why it is not advisable to use sodium metal in place of zinc. So in this experiment, why shouldn't, you, why shouldn't we place sodium metal there where zinc is so that hydrochloric acid to react with sodium, we are also going to get hydrogen because it is an acid reacting with the metal. We are also going to get, to get hydrogen because we are going to get salt uh, plus hydrogen gas. But why is it advisable not to use sodium? but only to use zinc, but not sodium. So the reason why you should not use sodium in this experiment, we see that sodium is highly, it's a highly reactive metal. Therefore, if we use sodium in place of zinc, sodium is going to explode. So the reaction is going to be explosive. And since the reaction is going to be explosive, it might turn to be violent. Therefore, the reason why you should not use sodium in place of zinc is because sodium, sodium's reaction with an acid is explosive. So the next question is asking, state two uses of hydrogen gas. So hydrogen gas can be used uh, in different ways. At least we are going to list about five, about four. So the first use of hydrogen is that it is used as rocket fuel. So rocket, they don't use petrol, they don't use, they only use hydrogen. So hydrogen is used as rocket fuel. So also in the developed countries, we see that the buses, their buses, they don't use petrol, like as our buses use petrol or diesel. So their buses use hydrogen. So we have hydrogen pumping stations whereby the buses would uh, pull themselves on the hydrogen stations and then they get refilled with hydrogen to, in order to act as the automobile or the bus, uh, the bus fuel. So they can also be used as uh, fuel for automobile. They can also be used for fuel for rockets, etc. So also hydrogen, they are used in hot air balloons, uh, mainly that are being used in the weather stations. So they are used in the hot air balloons uh, for recreation. First of all, no, the hot air balloons are used for recreation, uh, whereby we have this balloon which flows above, uh, it flies above everything for tourist attraction, for just recreation. Also, apart from that, hydrogen can also be used in weather balloons, whereby the hydrogen will be pumped in the weather balloon and then it will be released into the atmosphere in order 
uh, for certain gadgets to record the temperatures or the weather conditions above or on the clouds, etc. So also hydrogen uh, can be used in the manufacture of hydrochloric acid and also is used in the manufacture of ammonia gas in harbor process. So it is used in the manufacture of hydrochloric acid and it can also be used in the manufacture of, uh, of ammonia in a process which is referred to as harbor process. Then hydrogen is also used to solidify, to solidify oils to fats. So hydrogen is also used to solidify oils to fats. So let's now look at question number six. And question number six is asking, samples of urine were obtained from three participants, F, G, and H, at an international sports meeting and were spotted on a chromatography paper alongside two illegal drugs, that is drug A1 and drug A2. So a chromatogram was run using methanol. So the figure below shows the chromatogram. So as you can see, this is the chromatogram, but then we have the two drugs, drug A1 and drug A2, and then we have the blood for the participants, whereby we have F, G, and H. So as you can see, on this chromatogram, we have the solvent front, and that line over there is always the, mm, the solvent front, and that line whereby the spots are being placed, that line is always referred to as the baseline. So let's see. The first question is asking, identify the athlete who had used the illegal drug. So in this case, the athlete who had used the illegal drug, as you can see, it is athlete letter G. Why would you say athlete letter G? Because the sample for letter G is at an exact line with the sample for the drug A2. So since the drug A2, the, that dot, has reached that distance and then for G, exactly the same distance, it means that athlete G had the exact drug that is found in sample or the drug A2. So the next question is asking, which drug is more soluble in methanol? So the drug which will be more soluble in methanol here for us to know is the drug which is going to move further towards the solvent front. So in this case here we have drug A1 and we have drug A2. So which drug has moved further or closer to the solvent front? So it is drug A1. So for the drug A1, we see that it has moved even closer to the solvent front or it has split further or it has moved further from the baseline or the place where it was placed. So the drug that has moved uh, further from the baseline or closer to the solvent front is the one which is more soluble and that is drug A1. So let's go to the next number which is number seven and is asking. So the curve below represents the variation of temperatures with time when pure and impure samples of solids were heated separately. So you have these two curves or we have these two graphs uh, uh, when the two solids were heated separately. So we have solid one being heated and we also have solid two being heated as you can see on the graph. So the question is asking, so which curve shows the variation in temperature for a pure solid? So being given this graph, how will you be able to know that this is a graph representing a pure solid, this is a graph representing an impure solid? So for the pure solid, so the pure solid is graph number two. So graph number two is the pure solid and our answer. So graph number one is the impure solid. So why should we say that graph number one is impure? Why is it that graph number two is the pure solid? So graph number two is the pure solid because it has sharp melting point and boiling point. So since it has sharp melting point and boiling point, therefore that is the pure solid. So anytime you see a graph having smooth curves, so that means that that is an impure, impure solid. But anytime you will see in the graph, it has sharp edges. So that means that that is a pure, it's a pure solid. Yeah, so we have been told to explain. So the explanation why we chose two as the pure solid is, is because two, graph number two, has sharp melting point and sharp boiling point. So question number eight is asking, in an experiment, 
A test tube full of chlorine water was inverted in chlorine water as shown in the diagram below and left in the sunlight for one day. So the first question is asking, identify the gas that was produced. So as you can see, we had a gas jar full of chlorine and then we took that gas jar full of chlorine and we put it inside the water. So after some time, the water rose and covered all the, all the space that was inside the boiling tube or the test tube that we had inserted, just as the diagram shows. So we are being asked to identify the gas being produced. So in this case, the gas is going to be oxygen gas. So why did you say oxygen gas? So let's look at this reaction, how this reaction takes place. <laughs> so you see, if you react chlorine, chlorine is reacting with water. Remember, the boiling tube or the apparatus had chlorine, and then we inverted it, and then it chlorine reacted with water. So chlorine reacting with water, we are going to get hydrochloric acid and hypochlorous acid or chloric one acid. So if you can see, we are reacting chlorine, it's reacting with water, we get hydrochloric acid and then HOCl, which is hypochlorous acid or chloric one acid. So the next thing that happened here is that we are being asked that it was left in the sunlight. So being left in the sunlight, we see that chloric one or hypochloric acid is a very unstable acid. So it is very unstable, meaning that it will decompose easily when placed in the sunlight. So this chloric one is going to decompose in the sunlight to form hydrochloric acid plus oxygen gas. So that is where oxygen is coming from. So this chloric one or hypochlorous when placed in sunlight or when left exposed to the sunlight, it is going to break down to hydrochloric acid and oxygen gas, as you can see in the equation. So the first part of the equation, we see that Chlorine is reacting with water to get hydrochloric acid plus chloric one acid. The equation is balanced on its own. And then the next part of the question, you see that chloric one is decomposing in sunlight to form hydrochloric acid plus oxygen gas. So in this equation, to balance this equation, you only add two in front of the, in front of the chloric one, whereby this will mean that the chloric one, uh, hydrogen will have two molecules, Oxygen will also have two, and then chlorine will also have two. On this other side, we see that we are also going to add two in front of the hydrochloric acid, whereby if we add two, we are going to get two hydrogen, two chlorine, and then plus two molecules of oxygen, and the equation is balanced. So this is where we get the oxygen from. So let's look at question number nine. So question number nine is asking, the table below shows some physical properties and electronic arrangements of common ions and elements represented by letters P to X, as you can see. So study the information and answer the questions that follow. So the first question is asking, give the atomic number of the element P and Q. So you should give the atomic number of the elements P and Q that you can see there. So first of all, we see that P has... The ion of P is P2 positive. So remember what we said. So the element P is P2 positive. So if you see any positive or the charge of a positive, it means that it is losing electrons. So in this case, we're being told that the ion for P is P2 positive, meaning that it has lost two electrons. So the ionic arrangement, so the ionic arrangement of this is 288. So if the ionic arrangement is 288, so like what about the now the electronic configuration, the original electronic configuration? So since this P2 plus means that it has lost two electrons, and then we see that the ionic configuration is 288, it will mean that now the electronic configuration is supposed to be 2882. It means that this two that we have added is the one that was lost, uh, like according to the, to the ionic symbol of P. It was two positive. Now, since it's two positive, it means that it has lost two electron. Now, taking the ionic equation is 288. So if we add that two that was removed, it's going to be 2882. 
Now, since we know that it is 2882, so which element is this one? So this element is calcium, which is atomic number 20. So the next one that was being asked was element Q. As you can see, the, the ion for Q is Q and then negative. So since it, it is Q negative, that negative tells us that it has gained one electron. So you don't write negative one. If it is, uh, uh, like if it is one, we only refer to that one as negative. If it has gained or positive, it, if it has lost that one. So the ionic configuration of element Q is 2, 8. And then since we have that negative on Q, we know that it has gained one electron. So the electronic configuration of this Q, therefore, it's going to be 2, 7. Because since we had Q negative, that negative tells us that Q had gained one electron. So if it had gained one electron, so this one that you are seeing here is the ionic configuration. But what about the electronic configuration or the regional configuration? It's supposed to be 2, 7. So which is this element that is atomic number 9? So the atomic number 9 element is always fluorine. So fluorine is the one which is atomic number number nine. So let's take a look at some of this some of these ions that we have here. For example, we have ion letter R. So R we see that it has positive, so meaning that it has lost one. So since R has positive, and then the ionic the ionic arrangement we see that the ionic arrangement is two eight eight. So it will mean that since it has lost one, we are going to add that one to the configuration. So we're going to have two. 881. So which is this element? This is potassium. So potassium is always atomic number 19. Because if we add 2, we add it to 8, then we add it to 8 again, and then we add it to the one that we have just added, we are going to get 19. So potassium is always atomic number 19. So let's look at S. So S, we see that uh, the configuration of S is 2, 8. Then for S, we see that the charge or the valency for S is 3 positive. Anytime we, uh, we say that you are going to see a positive, so a positive charge means that it has gained, uh, it has lost uh, the electrons. So a negative always means that it has gained electron. So the other thing you should know about these charges uh, that we had mentioned is that anytime you will see a positive, so metals react by... Uh, so this charge of positive is always for metals. The charge for negatives is always for the non-metals. So in this case, we see that we have S and then three positive, meaning that S has lost three electrons. So since it has lost three electrons, S is automatically a metal because metal react by losing electrons. The non-metals react by gaining electrons. So in this case, we see that we have S three positive, and then the configuration for S is 2, 8. So what is the electronic configuration? We are being told that it has lost 3. So in this ionic configuration, let's add 3 in order to get the electronic configuration. So in this case, we are going to see that we add 3 to 2, 8. We are going to get 2, 8, 3. So which element is this that has 2, 8, 3 electronic configuration? It is always aluminium metal. So the aluminium metal is the one that is always number 13 in the periodic table. So that is the aluminium metal. So let's go to the next uh, question, which is Roman 2. And it's asking, state the most reactive element on this table. So which is the most reactive element? How will you know the most reactive element in this table? So there are two ways by which you can look at this table and know the most reactive element. So let's take uh, the first uh, the first one let's take uh, from the knowledge that we know. So if we have group 1 metals, so group 1 metals are the most reactive metal. So in this case how many group 1s do we have? We have element element R is in group 1 because it loses one. We also have element V because it loses one and element W because it also loses one electron. So we know that our answer falls between R, V, and W because these metals are the ones that are most reactive. So the other thing that we are going to check is that do we have lithium, do we have sodium, do we have potassium by looking at the electronic configurations that we have written and also if we can be able to, to know the electronic, electronic configuration, it will be easier. 
So in this case, we had already identified that we had potassium. Potassium, remember we say that it was the element which was element R having 2881. So since we have potassium uh, that has been labeled as element R, we know that our answer automatically becomes R. Why? Because potassium, by looking at the 20 elements, potassium is the most reactive metal in the periodic table by looking at the 20 elements of the periodic table. So our answer here is potassium or our answer here is element R. Why is it element R? Because element R has a very large atomic radius. So the other way by which you can be able to answer is by identifying in the periodic table which element, then we come and compare in the table. The other method is by checking the atomic radius. So the metal that is going to have the larger atomic radius is the one that is going to be the answer. So first of all, uh, uh, like let's take, for example, the elements that we had seen. So we had element R, remember? We had element V and we had element W in group 1. So which one had the largest atomic radius? Let's start from the lowest, W. So W had atomic radius of 0 0.152. And then V had an atomic radius of 0 0.186. And then R had an atomic radius of 0 0.231. So since R has a very large atomic radius for the metals this is since r has a very large atomic radius therefore r is the most reactive metal so our answer there select the most reactive metallic element the question of specific metallic element so the element was element r ah, so let's go to the next one which is roman 3 roman 3 is asking select three elements that belong to the same group of the periodic table elements belonging to the same group of the periodic table so let's take for example let's look at the chemical families so for the chemical families we know that group one elements are always referred to as the alkali metals group two elements are always referred to as alkaline earth metals so you should take you should take note never say that group one elements or write that group one elements are called alkaline metals. Never say group one are called alkaline metals. You are going to get it wrong. It's supposed to be alkali metals, not alkaline metals. So looking at group two, now group two are the ones which are called alkaline earth metals. Never mention group two as alkali earth metals. You'll get it wrong. So the answer must be alkaline earth metals. And then we have group 4. What's the name given to group 4? Group 4, they are referred to as the charcoals, whereby we have carbon ETC. They are referred to as the charcoals. So group 7, what is the name given to group 7? So group 7, they are called halogens or salt producers. So group 7, they are referred to as halogens. And what about group 8 elements? So group 8 elements, they, are, they may be called noble gases. They may be called inert gases they may also be called rare gases so it depends with what answer you want to give so getting back to this question we are being asked select three elements that belong to the same group of the periodic table now here in this case we have only been given this table that you can see we only have that table now using that table how will you able to know that these ones belong to the same group these ones belong to the same group and the same group so it is very easy to determine. You check the valency. So the elements that have the same valency, they are in the same group. The elements that have the same valency for positive, they are in the same group of metals. The elements that have the same valency for negative, they are in the same group for the non-metals. Now in this case, we see that the valency of P is 2 positive. The valency of Q is negative. The valency of R is positive. The valency of S is 3 positive etc so which elements belong to the same group so the elements belonging to the same group the first batch is that we have r v and w so the valency of r is positive one as you can see it is a positive value the valency of v is also positive the valency of w is also positive only one 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 so since they have the same valency it means that they belong to the same group the second batch we have, we have P, T, and U. 
So you see that P has a valency of 2 positive, letter T has a valency of 2 positive, and then letter U has a valency of 2 positive. Since they have the same valency, they belong to the same group. So since they have a valency of 2, it means that they are in group 2, which is referred to as the alkali, uh, the alkaline earth metals, if we are looking at the 20 elements. So they could have been in alkaline earth metal. The same uh, R, V, and W, since they only lose one, if we are looking at the 20 elements, be, they belong to the, uh, to alkali metals, which is group 1 elements. So Roman 4 is asking, select three elements that will react with cold water to evolve hydrogen gas. So in this table, the elements that will react with cold water to evolve or to produce hydrogen gas. So the first element that will react with water to produce hydrogen gas, we have element P. So if element P reacts with water, we get P hydroxide plus hydrogen gas, as you can see in the reaction. So P is a solid, P is a metal. It's a metal because it has a charge of positive. So writing the state symbol of P, it will be solid. So P reacting with water in liquid form because we are told cold water. So P reacting with water, the state symbol is liquid. We're going to get P hydroxide. So take note of the P hydroxide. P has a valency of two, and then the hydroxide is going to react as a valency of one. So we are going to get P, you open the bracket OH, and then you close the bracket two, and then plus hydrogen gas. So the next one that is going to evolve hydrogen gas, we are going to have element R. So if element R reacts with water, we are going to get R hydroxide plus hydrogen gas. Also we have element S. If element S reacts with water, we're going to get S hydroxide because it has a valency of 3. That's the reason why you're writing like that. So we're going to get S hydroxide plus hydrogen gas. Basically what you have noticed is that most metals, if metals react with water, we're going to get a metal hydroxide and hydrogen gas. So let's go to the next, which is Roman 5. We are being asked, why is the ionic radius of element X larger than the atomic radius? So by checking the table, where is element X? We see that this element X reacts by gaining electrons. So Sx reacts by gaining electrons. Therefore, since it gains electron, it is a nonmetal. It gains one electron. Therefore, it is a nonmetal. So before we answer this question, let's identify element X. So what is element X? We see that it has a valency of negative 1, or it has a valency of negative. Then, the ionic configuration is 288. So since the ionic configuration is 288, and we are being told that it has gained one electron, therefore, the electronic configuration will be 287. So that's the electronic configuration, 287. So what's the identity of element X? Element X, which is the element that is atomic number 17, it is always chlorine gas. So we are being asked, why is the ionic radius of element X larger than its atomic radius? So since we see X negative, negative it's a non-metal. It's like asking, why is it that the ionic radius of non-metals larger than the atomic radius? So the answer is so simple, it's because since non-metals react by gaining electrons, so the repulsion between the electron increases, therefore increasing the atomic, uh, the ionic radius. So base your answer based on the repulsion forces. So since we are adding electrons to the outermost energy level, so the repulsion between the electrons is going to increase. So since the repulsion between the electrons is going to increase, also the ionic radius will increase. The atomic radius is going just to remain the same, whereby we have 287. But since we add an electron to be 288, the electron's repulsion will increase. So since it will increase, we'll see that the ionic radius will always be larger than the atomic radius for the non-metals. But checking at the metals, we see that it is opposite. The atomic radius for the metals is always larger than the ionic radius. Because for metals, the more the metal loses electron, the more the nucleus 
uh, attracts the electrons even more strongly to the nucleus or to itself, therefore reducing the ionic radius. So for the nonmetals, remember, the more we add electrons, the more the electrons repel each other, increasing the ionic radius. For the metals, the more we lose electrons to the outermost energy level, the more nucleus holds the remaining electrons strongly to its core, therefore reducing, uh, reducing the ionic radius. So for the metals, atomic radius is larger than the ionic radius. For the nonmetals, ionic radius is larger than the atomic radius. So, Roman 6, write an equation for the reaction between S and oxygen. So, we write an equation that is formed when S reacts with oxygen. So, S, what's the identity to element X that we gave? S, we gave it identity of aluminium, whereby we saw that S is atomic number 13. So, which element is always atomic number 13? It's always aluminium. But in this case, we have not been asked to use aluminium. We have only been asked to use S. So our answers, we are going to write our answers with using only S. So, the chemical equation, as you can see, we are reacting S, which is solid, S reacting with oxygen, which is a gas, then we get, uh, we are going to get S2O3. So that is going to be the product, S2O3. So balancing the equation, we are going to balance the equation, as you can see, we are going to have four molecules of S, reacting with three molecules of oxygen gas to get uh, 2S2 and then O3. So we're going to put 4 in front of S, we're going to put 3 in front of oxygen, then we're going to put 2 in front of uh, the product that you're going to get, S2, ox S3 oxide rather. So for the product, why have we written the product as S2O3? Why is it that we have written S2O3? So it is simple like this. So to get the product, we must know the valency of the reacting elements. So we must know the valency of the reacting elements. So in this case, we know that the valency of S is 3 positive. The valency of oxygen. The valency of oxygen is always 2 negative. So how will you determine the valency of oxygen? The atomic number of oxygen is 8. The atomic number of oxygen is 8. So, since the atomic number is 8, the electronic configuration of oxygen is going to be 2, 6. So, since the electronic configuration of oxygen is 2, 6, how many electrons does oxygen require in order to become stable? So, oxygen requires only 2 electrons to become stable as to achieve 2, 8 in order to become stable. So, since oxygen gains two electrons to become stable, therefore the valency of oxygen is two negative. It gains. So since it gains electron, the valency will be two negative. For the S, as we have been given in the table, S is two, eight, three. So S reacts by losing electron. Since S loses three electrons, it will have an ionic configuration of two, eight. It is stable. So the valency of S is 3 positive, the valency of oxygen is 2 negative. So if for us to get the product, these two things will exchange the valency. So the valency of S is going to go below the oxygen, the valency of oxygen is, is going to come below the, the valency of S, and that's why we get S2O3. So anytime you want to write a chemical equation, you must know the valency. So to get the product, it's so simple, the valency just interchange. So you just interchange the valency of this in endahuko, this other valency, it comes on this side, and then that's the product you get. Like in our case, we have S2 or 3, so that was the answer. Then you must know how to balance the equation, and also you must always write the state symbols. It is very important to also write the state symbols in these chemical equations. So let's go to number 10. So number 10, we are being asked that moist iron wool was inverted over water, as you can see. So moist iron wool was inverted over water. So the setup was left to stand for two days. So for this reaction, we are basically reacting iron with water. 
because iron iron wool is iron we are reacting iron with water so the first question we are being asked explain whether rusting is a physical or a chemical reaction so rusting is rusting a physical or a chemical reaction so rusting is a chemical reaction not a physical reaction so the other name of chemical reaction is a permanent reaction the other name of permanent reaction also is an irreversible reaction or an irreversible change so it has three names we can be told chemical reaction or a chemical change we can be told a permanent change or also we can also be be asked or we can also say that it is an irreversible reaction or an irreversible change so rusting is not physical rusting is a chemical because we always get a permanent a permanent product if rusting occurs we are going to get a permanent product whereby we are going to have hydrated iron 3 oxide as the chemical name for rusting so the next question which is b we are being asked write an expression using x and y to show the percentage of oxygen so write an equation or an expression using x and y that you can see so y as you can see is the total amount of oxygen that was in the boiling tube or in the apparatus before the experiment proceeded so y was the total amount of oxygen in the apparatus before the experiment proceeded and then for x we see that x is formed after the experiment has ended sorry after the experiment has ended therefore we form x so write an expression using x and y to show the percentage of oxygen that was used up in the experiment or percentage of oxygen so the expression is simple so first of all we will take the total amount of oxygen that was in the gas jar minus the amount of oxygen remaining in the gas jar in order to find the amount of oxygen that was used for the process of rusting and then we always divide by the total amount of oxygen that was present initially and then we multiply by 100 so that is the formula so you take the total amount of oxygen you subtract from the oxygen remaining in order to get the amount of oxygen used then you divide by the total amount of oxygen that was there initially in the gas jar before the experiment proceeded and then since you have been asked the percentage you multiply by a hundred so that is the answer so the next question is asking what will be the effect of using a larger piece of iron wool? So instead of using that small piece of iron wool over there, so what will be the effect of using a larger piece of iron wool? Nothing will happen because since the oxygen amount will be that set amount, so even if we place a larger piece of iron wool in the apparatus, so still the experiment is going to stop at exactly the same, the same place. Why is this so? Because the oxygen amount in the gas jar initially will be exactly the same. So if you use a small iron wool, the oxygen am amount lambda uh, will be about 50%. If you use a larger iron wool, the oxygen will still be 50%. So nothing really is going to happen in this experiment. So the only thing that's going to happen in this experiment as far as the reaction is concerned, the reaction will, will be faster. But the amount of oxygen being used will remain exactly the same. So the next one we are being asked, state two similarities between rusting and combustion. So what are the similarities between rusting and combustion? So in rusting and combustion, we have uh, in both of them, there is, also, there is always a new substance being formed. Because if we burn a candle, rather not a candle, if we burn a paper in form of combustion, if iron wool will rust, so we are going to get, we are going to get a new substance so in both of them we see that heat is being produced in both of them so both of them must use heat so heat must be produced or rather not must use heat but heat is produced in both of them for rusting process to take place there's the evolution of heat and also in combustion there's also the usage of heat so both of them heat must be present for both of them to take place also for both of them, we see that oxygen is used up in both of them. So rusting must use oxygen and then also combustion must also use oxygen. 
So, what is the, the chemical name for rusting? Because rusting is just the layman, layman's term. You'll see that this iron wool is, is rusted. So, uh, like what is the chemical name for rusting? So, the chemical name of rusting is always hydrated iron 3 oxide. So, that oxide means that there was, ox there was the presence of oxygen for this process of rusting to take place. So, the chemical name of rusting is hydrated iron 3 oxide. So, let's now look at question number 11. So, question number 11 is asking, observe the equation below, whereby we have iron 3 oxide reacting with carbon 2 oxide, then we get iron which is solid plus carbon 4 oxide in gaseous form. So, the first Roman 1 is asking, balance the equation. So, to balance this equation, you are going to compare the elements on this side and the elements on the other side. So, for the iron 3 oxide, it's the value still remains to be 1. Then from the, the carbon 2 oxide, we are going to put 3 so that we have 3 molecules of carbon and 3 molecules of oxygen. And then on the product side, we are going to have 2 molecules of iron and then we are going to have 3 molecules of carbon 4 oxide. So if you do this, if you look at the elements on this side and that other side, you'll realize that on this side we have only two uh, only two ion on this side we have only two ion on this side we have about um, we have about five oxygen on this other side we also have about five oxygen etc etc and the equation you will realize that the equation is balanced here yeah, so the equation is balanced so Roman 2 is asking select the following from the above equation so oxidizing agent so looking at this equation which is the oxidizing agent so in this equation, the oxidizing agent is ion 3 oxide. And then for the next one, we are being asked the reducing agent. So the reducing agent is carbon 2 oxide. So this carbon 2 oxide, it is reducing the ion 3 oxide to ion. And then it is oxidizing itself from carbon 2 oxide to carbon 4 oxide. So you should always know that carbon 2 oxide is a very strong reducing agent. So apart from this carbon 2 oxide, we also have other reducing agents. Like for example, we have sodium borohydride. We also have hydrogen. We also have diborane. And we also have uh, metal iodides. Like for example, we may have potassium iodide. We may have sodium iodide, etc. So the reducing agents, we have about 20 or more reducing agents whereby carbon 2 oxide is one of the strong reducing agents that we have. So the next question is asking, state two situations whereby redox reaction is applicable in industry. So where is redox reaction applicable in industry? So first of all, we have extraction of different metals from their metal ores. Example, we have the iron metal, and also we have purification of different metals. So after extracting that metal, we, we will also want to purify the metal. So the other example also we have, we have iron. So also iron can be extracted using this redox reaction after the blast furnace experiment has been taking place or the extraction process, we use the redox reaction again to purify the iron metal. So also we have electroplating, whereby in electro, electroplating, redox reaction is basically used. And also in the fuel cells, we'll see that it also uses redox reactions. So question number 12 is asking, carbon dioxide sublimes at negative 78 degrees Celsius. So it is called a dry ice. Then A is asking, why is it called a dry ice? So why is it that this carbon dioxide is always referred to as the dry ice. Even if you check the fire extinguishers, you will note that the fire extinguisher edges are written dry ice representing this carbon dioxide inside the fire extinguisher. So why is it called dry ice? It is called dry ice because fr from being a solid, it immediately changes to gas. So it does not leave any liquid traces. Remember, liquids are what make things wet. So since it changes state straight from solid to gas and not passing through the liquid phase, that is why it is referred to as the, it is referred to as the dry ice. So remember, it changes straight from solid to gaseous phase. It doesn't pass through the liquid phase. 
and that's the reason why it is referred to as dry ice. So the next question is asking, uh, we are being told that it is used for keeping ice cream cold. So why is it prefer than dry ice? So uh, like why should you use carbon dioxide other than using the ice from the fridge? So use this carbon dioxide uh, first of all because it is not, it doesn't become wet. So since it doesn't become wet, it will not anyhow spoil the cream or dilute the cream. The other reason is because it takes a very long time for it to sublime. So it takes a very long time for it to sublime. Because we see for the ice, uh, uh, if we impart some very low temperatures to ice, it will begin to melt. But for the dry ice, it takes a lot of time for it now to begin the process of sublimation, etc. So the next question you're being asked, name two other substances that behave as dry ice. So which other two substances behave as dry ice? So what this question is asking, this question is asking which, has, which other substances sublime? So apart from the dry ice, which, has, which other substances sublime? We have naphthalene. So apart from the naphthalene, we have benzoic acid. As you can see, that's the benzoic acid. We have benzoic acid. Apart from the benzoic acid, we have uh, ion 3 chloride. Yes, we have ion 3 chloride. We also have cobalt 3 chloride. And lastly, we have iodine. So all these substances sublime just as how carbon uh, solid, carbon 4 oxide, or the dry ice would sublime. So let's continue to number 13. So number 13, it's asking, it's saying that the element X has two isotopes. So two-thirds of, two thirds of 33 X 16 and one-third of the mass number 30 X and then the atomic number 16. So let's continue to number 13. So number 13 is saying, that the element X has two isotopes. The first one is two thirds of the mass number 33 and atomic number 16. And the second one is one third of mass number 30 and atomic number 16. So the question is asking, determine the relative mass of element X. So the relative mass is, is also asking something like the average mass of element X. So here we have been given two thirds of 33 and one third of 30. So how are we going to do this to determine the relative mass? So this is how we calculate. So we'll take that two thirds multiplied by the mass number, which is, is 33, and then we add with one third multiplied by the, uh, the mass number, which is 30. So if we add these two, we are going to get that the relative mass is going to be 32. So that's how we calculate the relative mass. So you take the fraction, you multiply by the mass number you have been given for that, uh, for that element, and then you take the, the next fraction and the mass number that you have been given for the second element, and you determine the relative mass by adding both of them. So the next question is asking. Uh, we are being told that, the er that there was an element A which had a mass, uh, which had 20 protons and 25 neutrons. So an element A has 20 protons and 25 neutrons. What is Roman 1? The mass number of element A. So what did you define mass number as? So you say that the mass number, this is the sum of protons and the neutrons in an element of an atom. Or this is, the, uh, this is the number of protons and the neutrons in an atom. They give us the mass number. So here we've been given, we have 20 protons and 25 neutrons. So what is the mass number? The mass number is 20 plus 25, you're going to get 45. So the mass number is 45. So since we have 20 protons, which element is this? Which element has 20 protons? That is automatically calcium. So calcium has 20 protons. So Roman 2 is asking, uh, the charge on the most stable ion of element A. So the charge of element A, what will be the charge of element A? So for this element A, we see that it has 20 protons. So the atomic number of A is equal to 20 because the number of protons is always equal to the number of, to the atomic number. So the atomic number is 20. 
So since the atomic number is 20, what is the electronic configuration? So the electronic configuration will be 2882. So since it is 2882, this element A is going to lose the two electrons in the outermost energy level in order to become stable. Since it will lose the two electrons to become stable, therefore, the valency of element A is going to be 2 positive. Since it loses electrons, the charge, we say that it is positive. In this case, since it loses two electrons, therefore, we're going to write 2 and then positive. So remember what we said in the previous questions. We said that if an element has a charge of positive, it is a metal. If an element has a charge of negative, it is a non-metal. So let's continue to the next question. Let us see. It's asking, uh, we've been told uh, that an element B consists of three isotopes. So the first isotope has a mass number of, 29, of 28, the next one 29, and lastly 30. Uh, the percentage abundances of these elements are 92.2%, the first one, 4.7% the second one, and then 3.1% the third one. So the question is asking, show that the relative atomic mass of the element is 28.11. So being given the masses and the percentage abundance, we are to show that the relative atomic mass is 28.11. So how do you calculate the relative atomic mass? First of all, what is, what is the definition for relative atomic mass? So the relative atomic mass, this is the mass of any atom compared to 1 twelfth that of carbon atom. So that is the definition of relative atomic mass. So this is the mass of any atom. The mass of any atom compared to 1 twelfth that of carbon atom. That is the definition of relative atomic mass. And now to calculate here the relative atomic mass, it's also as simple as the one that we have just done earlier whereby uh, we are going to take 28 multiplied by the abundance, which is 92.2, and then we divide by 100. Then we take the second one that we are given, we are given 29. So that one, we add it to 29 multiplied by the abundance, which was 4.7%, then divided by 100, and then we add by the third one, which is uh, it's 30 multiplied by the abundance, which is 3.1, divided by 100. And then you will get the relative atomic mass to be 28.11. So it's just that. So you take the mass number for the first one, multiply by the abundance that you have been given for that mass number, divided by 100. And then that one, you add it to the second one, uh, whereby it's 29. So you take 29, you multiply by the abundance given 4.7% divided by 100. And then you add it again by the third one, uh, which is... 30 divided by, divided by the abundance, which is 3.1, divided by 100. And then you add everything up. So if you add everything up, you are going to get 28.11%. So that is the simplest way in order uh, to calculate the relative atomic mass. You just multiply the mass number by the abundance divided by 100, and then you add everything up to get the relative atomic mass. So the next question you are being asked we are being told that the element X and Y have atomic numbers of 11 and 17 respectively. So which of the elements is a metal? Give a reason. So being given these two elements, element X has atomic number of 11. Element Y has atomic number of 17. So we are being asked, which of these two elements is a metal? Explain your answer. Let's begin with element X. We have been told that this element X has atomic number of 11. So what is the configuration of element X? Since it has ato uh, the atomic number of 11, so the configuration is going to be 2, 8, 1. So that will be the electronic configuration. The configuration of element X is 2, 8, 1. So let's look at element Y. So the element Y has atomic number of 17. What is the configuration of element Y? So the configuration of element Y is 2, 8, Seven. So that is element Y. So let's determine the ions of X and Y. So the ions of X and Y. So for X, we see that the configuration is 2, 8, 1. So X is going to lose one electron in order to be stable. And remember what we said earlier, we said that if they lose electron, the charge is positive. 
if they gain electron, the charge is negative. And then also we say that all metals react by losing electrons. All nonmetals react by gaining electrons. So the charge for losing, we say that it is positive. The charge for gaining, we say that it is negative. So in this case, we see that X is 281. X is going to lose one electron in order to be stable. Since X will lose one electron to be stable, therefore X is the metal. And we have been asked to explain. So explain why X is the metal. So X is a metal because it reacts by losing one electron. So this element Y is a non-metal because Y is 287. So it is easier for Y to gain one electron to be stable 288 than to lose the seven electrons to become stable. So since Y reacts by gaining electrons, therefore Y is a non-metal. X on this other hand, it's a metal because it reacts by losing electrons. So we are in letter E. So letter E is asking. The table below shows the atomic number of four elements, which is W, X, Y, and Z. As you can see, that is the table showing W, X, Y, and Z. So we, the question is asking, which two elements belong to the same group? So if you look at the table, which two elements belong to the same group? For you to know which elements belong to the same group, you must write the electronic configuration. We have been given W, X, Y, and Z. For you to know which one belongs to the same group, you must write the electronic configuration. So let's see for W. What's the configuration for W? Because the last value is always the group number. So the last value is always the group number. The, the figures are always the number of periods. So if we have one, two, three, it belongs to period three. The last number is always the group number. So let's look at W. W is, the atomic number of W is 20. So since atomic number is 20, what's the configuration? The configuration of W will be 2882. So the last figure for W is 2. Let's look at X. X, the configuration is 287 because it's atomic number 17, so it is 287. So this X, the charge of X is negative. The charge of W is 2 positive because it loses the two. The charge for X is negative because it gains one. Let's look at Y. So the charge for Y, uh, rather, the electronic configuration for Y, it is 2881. So it is 2881 to make 19. So since it is 2881, it means that Y loses one electron to be stable. So the charge for Y is Y and positive. So let's look at Z. So the configuration for Z is 2, 7. Now, let's look at X. The configuration for X was 2, 8, 7. So the last value is 7. So the configuration of Y is 2, 7. So since X and Y have the same figure, uh, the outermost energy level has the same figure of 7, it, it, it means that they belong to the, to the same group, which is group number 7. So group number seven is referred to as halogens. So halogens, they gain one electron to be stable. Whereby we see that the charge for X is negative and the charge for Y is also Y and negative. So they belong to group number seven. So getting back to our question, which two elements belong to the same group? So we have element X and element Z, not Y rather. Element X and element Z. So X is 287, and then Z is 27. Uh, correct that mistake that I had made. Yeah, so they belong to the same group because the outermost energy level has the same figure. Also, if you write the ions, they all gain one electron. So that is X and Z. So let's look at the next one. The next uh, number we are being asked that two elements M and N have atomic number of 17 and 20 respectively. So write the formula of the compound formed when M reacts with N. So write the formula when M reacts with N. So I've been told that element M has atomic number of 17. What's the configuration? The configuration is 2, 8, 7. So 
the ion for M is M and then negative. So that is the, the ion for M. We must know this valency in order to write the, the equation. So uh, like without this valency, we can't be able to know the equation. So that's why we must write the configuration. We know the valency and then we put it in the equation. So the valency of M is negative. 287, it means that it is negative. So it gains, it loses rather negative it means that it gains so it gains one electron to be stable so let's look at the next one which you have been asked so element n element n is 20 atomic number 20 so since it's atomic number 20 what's the configuration so configuration will be 2882 so the ionic uh, the ion form of element n is n and then 2 positive so look here so this element N loses two electrons, so it is two positive, loses two electrons to be stable. Element N gains one electron to be stable. So since we know the valency, the valency of N is two positive. The valency of M is M negative. So it will be now easy for us to write the chemical equation, whereby we're going to react N, metals react by losing electrons, so all metals are solid. So the state symbol of N will be solid. So if we react N, reacting with M, M is a gas. So all gases are molecules. And all gases should be represented with a 2, with a small 2 down there. Like for example for M. M is a gas, so since it's a gas, we must represent it with a 2. Meaning that it's a molecule. So M which is a solid, N which is a solid rather, reacting with M which is a gas, we are going to get NM2. So... To balance this equation, we see that the equation is already balanced because N is 1, M is 2. On the product side, we have N, which is 1, and M, which is 2. So the equation is balanced. So take note of the state symbol. Letter N is a solid, letter M is a gas, and then the product you're going to obtain, we're going to obtain also a solid. So NM2 is a solid because it's like burning iron on air. So if you burn iron in air, you are going to obtain ash. So the ash is a solid. So let's go to the next number, which is number 14. We are being asked, the diagram below represents a non-luminous flame of the Bunsen burner. So remember, we have two types of flames. We have the luminous flame, which is always yellow, and a luminous flame, which is always blue in color. So name parts of the flame A, B, and C. So name part A, B, and C. So part A is referred to as the pale blue zone. So avoid saying blue zone. Avoid saying the blue, it's called the blue zone. But mention it as pale blue region or pale blue zone. So you must say pale blue. So region B is referred to as green blue region. So this region is referred to as green blue. Never in your exam say that it is referred to as greenish. Never say greenish greenish blue you'll get it wrong because of that ish so it's it's only supposed to be green blue region not greenish blue or not green bluish it's supposed to be green blue region so letter c is referred to as the almost colorless region or it might also be called region of unburnt gases so it can be called either a region of unburnt gases or almost colorless region so, uh, letter B, we are being asked, which part in A above is the hottest? So, which part in the Bunsen burner is the hottest? So, it is part A. So, part A is the hottest. I didn't say, the, I didn't give the answer as pale blue, but I used what I was asking the question. The question is asking, which part? So, if it's asking which part, use the labeled part, so A, B, C. So, the part which is the hottest is part labeled A. And part labeled A, remember, uh, we say that, part A, remember, we say that it is the pale blue, pale blue region. So it is part A. So see, we are being asked, a non-luminous flame is preferred for heating. Explain. So why is the non-luminous flame preferred for heating? First of all, the non-luminous flame is very hot. That is the first reason. The second and the only reason is that it does not produce soot. So those are only the two reasons why a luminous flame is preferred for heating. The first reason we say that it is because it is very hot. The second reason is that it, produce, it does not produce soot. 
So letter D, Roman 1. Name other type of flame produced by the Bunsen burner. So this type of flame is the luminous flame. So which other flame is produced by the Bunsen burner? We have the, this is the non-luminous flame. So the other flame produced by the Bunsen burner is the luminous flame. So this is the non-luminous flame. The other flame is the, uh, the luminous flame. So Roman 2, you are being asked that under what condition does the Bunsen burner produce the flame you have named in Roman 1? So uh, like under what condition does the Bunsen burner produce the luminous flame? So the condition is that the air hole must be closed. So if you close the air hole, there'll be no air entering into the chimney. Since there's no air entering into the chimney, there'll be incomplete combustion of the, of the gases. This incomplete combustion will result to a luminous flame, which is yellow in color. If the air hole is open, therefore, a lot of air is going to enter into the chimney, and then there will be complete combustion of the gases, and the gas that will be produced will be a non-luminous flame, which is blue in color. So number 15, we'll just go through it. We are being asked to balance the following chemical equations whereby we are having magnesium reacting with oxygen and then we are getting magnesium oxide. So to balance this equation, you only add two uh, on magnesium and then two on the product side, whereby we'll have two molecules of magnesium on the reactant side, we'll have one molecule of, of oxygen on the reactant side and then on the product side, we are also going to have two molecules of magnesium and then that two also reflects for the oxygen. So the next one is balance the equation magnesium reacting with the nitrogen. So the valency of nitrogen is always 3. And that's why in the product side we have Mg3 and the valency of magnesium is 2 and we have N2. So the valencies interchange in forming the products. So to balance this reaction, we'll only add 3 in front of magnesium and then the equation is balanced. So the next one is aluminium plus hydrochloric acid. Acid reacting with the metal, we get salt plus hydrogen gas. We'll add two in front of aluminium, and also we'll add two in front of aluminium three chloride to balance the equation. So the next one, uh, we have we have propane. So the next one is propane reacting with oxygen. So if propane reacts with oxygen, if a hydrocarbon reacts with oxygen, we always get carbon dioxide and water molecule. So in this case. This is a hydrocarbon. This is propane reacting with oxygen. So if they react with oxygen, we get uh, three molecules of carbon dioxide and four molecules of water, and the equation is balanced. So let's go to question number 16. And it's saying, hydrated copper 2 sulfate is heated in a boiling tube as shown in the diagram. So in this diagram, we are heating hydrated copper 2 sulfate. What do we mean by the term hydrated? So hydrated means that this salt has water of crystallization. So some water has been added to this salt or this salt has water of crystallization. That is the meaning of hydrated. The opposite of hydrated is anhydrous. So hydrated means that the salt has water inside. Anhydrous means that the salt is dry. So note those two differences. You might be asked differentiate between hydrated salt and an anhydrous salt. So hydrated salt will say that this is a salt that has water of crystallization inside it. And then you'll also say that while anhydrous salt is a salt that is a dry salt or is a salt that does not have water of crystallization. So hydrated copper 2 sulfate is heated in the boiling tube as shown in the diagram, as you can see. So Roman 1, state the color of copper 2 sulfate before and after heating. So before heating, hydrated copper 2 sulfate is blue in color, as you can see. Before heating, that is the color of hydrated copper 2 sulfate. It is always blue in color. So after heating, we are going to drive out the water from the salt. So if you drive out the water from the salt, the salt will, will remain dry. So dry salt, we say that it is called anhydrous salt. So state the color of the copper 2 sulfate before heating is blue in color. After heating anhydrous, it is white in color. So hydrated copper 2 sulfate is always blue in color. Anhydrous copper 2 sulfate is always white in color. So Roman 2 is asking, explain why the boiling tube was slanted. As you can see, the boiling tube has been slanted, has been inclined. So why is it that the boiling tube 
was slanted. So the boiling tube was slanted in order to prevent the water from the hydrated salt. So in order to prevent the water from flowing back uh, to hydrate the salt. So that's the first reason. So it was slanted in order to prevent the water of crystallization that was formed or that was produced and landed on the edges of the test tube from going back and uh, reacting again with the anhydrous salt to make it hydrated. So that's the first reason. So the second reason why it was slanted, it was in order to make the water of crystallization not flow back to the regions whereby the heating is taking place and therefore breaking the, uh, breaking the boiling tube. So remember, if you heat a glass and then you pour water, that glass is going to break immediately. So the reason why it is slanted, it is in order to prevent the water from flowing back and therefore breaking the glass uh, on the points of where the glass is being heated. So those are the two answers. So Roman 3 is asking, how can the purity of the colorless liquid be confirmed? If we heat this salt, there will be some colorless liquid formed on the edges of the test tube. So that is the water of crystallization. So that's why we are being asked, how can the purity of the colorless liquid be tested? So how do you test for the purity of liquids? You just check the melting point and the boiling point. So here the answer was by checking the melting point and the boiling point of the colorless of the colorless liquid. So if, for example, the colorless liquid is water, it's supposed to boil at 100 degrees Celsius and melt at zero degrees Celsius. So how to determine the purity of this, uh, of this colorless liquid is by checking the melting point and the boiling point. So it was that simple. So the last one is name any other substance that can undergo the same change as hydrated copper 2 sulfate. So the change exhibited by hydrated, hydrated copper 2 sulfate is simply dehydration. Hydrated has water. If we heat, uh, the water of crystallization leaves. So this question is asking, name other hydrated salt that you know. So we have something sodium carbonate decahydrate. We have sodium sulfate pentahydrate. We also have sodium hydrogen sulfate uh, pentahydrate. Any salt that you think has water of crystallization is a hydrated salt and it can fit here. So any hydrated salt can be used in place of hydrated copper to sulfate. So the last question, we are being asked that a magnesium ribbon was cleaned with steel wool and used in the following setup as you can see. So we are being asked that wet sand was heated before magnesium ribbon. So in this experiment, first of all, we heated the wet sand. So after heating the wet sand, that is then again, we began heating the magnesium ribbon. So the first question is asking, Explain the following, Roman 1. Explain the following. Sand was heated before heating magnesium ribbon. So why should we heat the wet sand first before heating magnesium ribbon? So first of all, we will heat the wet sand in order to produce steam. So that is the only reason. We only heat the wet sand in order to produce steam. So uh, like in place of the wet sand, we can also use cotton wool. So you might be told that it is wet cotton wool or you can be told it is wet sand. So the answer is still the same. So why is the wet sand heated before heating magnesium? So we heat the wet sand in order to generate steam to react with the magnesium.